The universe is knowable. One need not appeal to mystical, magical forces to account for things. In my last video, I talked about hot reading techniques that psychics use to research their victims ahead of time. But what about when they have to read a live audience or read a stranger on the spot? For that, they usually resort to cold reading tactics. If you're unfamiliar with their tricks, it may seem impressive, but if you know what to look for, then a psychic hustle will smell fishier than a rotten tuna. Now there's a lot more to cold reading than I could possibly cover in just one video, so make sure that you subscribe and keep an eye out for part two. The most obvious aspect of cold reading is shotgunning, where you shotgun out a question into the audience and hope that it sticks with someone somewhere. Who had the issue with the brain? Aneurysm, brain tumor, Alzheimer, or dementia? But, yeah. but for those, you know, some people watching this will say, and I, I'm a skeptic, we'll say, look, you're Fishing. you know, in a room of, of 250 people, whatever, somebody will certainly have had Alzheimer's. It's the details that spirit gives mm -hmm. is what is mind-blowing. It is not common that someone would lay someone to rest in a fuchsia dress. But did she really get a fuchsia dress? Who was buried in a red dress? Or well, someone was viewed, because they, they had me stand at a casket and I saw someone viewed and they said, can you believe that this is how I was laid to rest? Notice how she started specific with a red dress, then went more vague. If you start specific and get a hit, people are pretty impressed. But by resorting and shifting to a vaguer image, she increases her odds of getting a hit. Sure enough, someone on the other side of the room buried someone in a fuchsia dress. My mother was in a fuchsia dress. But wait a second. Caputo seemed to imply that she guessed the fuchsia dress. It's the details that spirit gives is what is mind-blowing. It is not common that someone would lay someone to rest in a fuchsia dress. Making it seem like she was more accurate than before. Remember, she guessed either a red dress or an odd burial, not a fuchsia dress, which is what the lady on the other side of the room connected with. But let's be generous and give Caputo the benefit of the doubt here. Let's not assume that she's trying to mislead and maybe that she just misremembered or didn't articulate her thoughts very well. Even still, how is it that psychics like her seem to get nothing but hits with audience members? When a person in the audience connects with something, psychics often fire off a barrage of questions, reading a person's body language to see if they got a hit or not. If the person's nodding, smiling, or crying, they'll pause and let them elaborate, but if they look puzzled or taking too long thinking about it or shaking their head, the psychic is quick to rattle off more questions until one of them sticks. Does, does that make sense? Or do you understand that? Mm, well, who passed from the chest? This way, the misses are less obvious and only the hits stick, and when they do, they resonate. The person, after all, is desperately hoping for a connection and is usually more than willing to help the psychic out and make the guesses fit. We okay. both lost our brother, Bob. Um, okay, Bob, yeah. Bob's spirit's here. And, and if it becomes obvious that nothing's sticking, the psychic can easily excuse it away with something like, I could be piggybacking. Because I might be piggybacking. Or it could be someone else in this area. Somebody's in prison, or somebody was in prison. So in this section, Somebody was in prison. Or think about it, you could remember later. Maybe have a think about it, it may come back a little bit later on, mm -hmm. okay. But how do they get a hit with something like, I'm feeling a father figure who died of cancer with a J name like James connected? If you're going to make a guess as a psychic, and let's face it, all cold reading is is a series of questions, guesses, general statements, and inferences based on observation, you're going to want those guesses to be high probability, without people realizing that you're playing the odds. Here's a great example. James Van Prague has just turned his back and had the show host give some ribbons to a random person in the audience for him to blindly read by holding a matching pair of ribbons. Is this a female that is holding these? Yes. No shit, Sherlock. You're in a room packed with women. I see maybe four dudes in the entire audience, but most psychics are more discreet than this. If I claim to be a psychic and guess that someone in a crowd knows a John Smith, nobody would be impressed. But did you know that James not John is the most common guy's name in the US? Who is James? Who had the Jim in that family? Or the James? Is the Jimmy or James connected? For girls, the most common name is Mary. The name of either Mary, Margaret. Is there a Mary person, like a Marie, a Mary? Got a connection to Mary. I'm getting Marie, Mary, Maria. And who is the MR name? Mark, Mary, Marie. While people are more impressed when a psychic guesses an exact name, more often than not, psychics just guess an initial. I feel he's a he's like a J. He's also showing me a J, J. Why can't they just talk? Why does it gotta be, there's a J name, there's a this? Well, because even when guessing the most common guy's name in America, these vultures still get misses. No. Is he J-A or J-U or just, or is he's not John or 
Jay, I don't know the name. Jay, 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 Jerry, Jeffrey. Jez. 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 Okay, close Jez. enough. I probably, I don't know that I get that. No, no. Because I was a James. If they go from James to a J sounding name, then they can radically increase their odds. But sometimes even that fails. Or J. Is it J sounding? Or G? It could be G. Does, her, is your her sister G? Jerry? Bingo. Throw in a J sounding G name like George, Gerald, etc. And they even further increase their odds. They tell me to talk about the J or G name like Jack or James. They tell me to talk about the J or G connection. There's a J or G name that they want me to highlight. Is there a J or G in that name like Marjorie? Is that where like the J or G like George or J Jerry comes up? Where's the J or G name? Are you the J or G sounding name like Janie or Joni? Who is the J name? It's a J. Or G. Giovanni, but we called him Johnny. Jim. Judith. My name's Jade. Because it would be too time consuming to examine every name in America, let's look at the top 200 names in the US over the last 100 years according to the Social Security Administration. 38 of the top 200 names in America start with J or G. That's 19%. To keep the math simple, we'll say one in five. That doesn't seem like that high of a number, but think of it this way. Here's an example of a pretty small family tree. Only counting close relatives like grandparents, parents, parents, uncles, aunts, siblings, nephews, nieces, and cousins, there are already 20 people here. If you're married, you can double that number with in-laws. But I don't want people to accuse me of exaggerating, so I'll lowball the estimate. Now take that 1 in 5 statistic. Odds are that about 4 people in this family of 20 will have a J or a G name. Assuming that no one in the audience is married or has a massive family, then in an audience of about 250 people, there will be approximately 1,000 J or G name family members represented. Now most people who go to these types of readings go to connect with one or multiple lost family members, meaning that there's probably at least 250 deceased people represented by this audience. If one in five of those 250 have J or G names, then that's 50 deceased people with J or G names represented in an audience this size. And remember, that's on the low end assuming everyone has a small family and isn't married. But most people in these audiences are older, probably have larger families, and have probably married at least once, so that number is almost definitely much higher. Now, the leading causes of death in the US are heart disease and cancer by a long shot, usually targeting the middle-aged or elderly. In a room full of adults, it's pretty high odds that someone has lost a father to one of these causes. Who had the heart problem? But just to be safe, the psychic can increase their odds further by guessing a father figure, which includes fathers, uncles, grandfathers, fathers-in-law, adopted fathers, or just a fatherly friend. I feel like there's a father figure reference that they want me to bring through, but that to me would be like father, uncle, grandfather. First thing I have a man here is a father figure that comes to me, and I, I'm, I gotta feel like I'm over here. They tell me to acknowledge a male figure to the side who has crossed over, that's maybe like husband, brother, cousin, or friend. Is your dad passed? Uh, no. Who's the father figure who's passed? My grandfather. Your grandfather. And he must have been like a dad figure for you, and in some respects, it feels more like a father in the spirit world. I don't know if your dad's passed, but in that back section, I've got an older male who's coming through back there. But it's an older male energy that's maybe like father, uncle, grandfather. Okay, is there a father figure that's passed? Older male figure that's passed that would be like a father figure. Now, if you throw it all together, you have a deceased father figure who died of cancer, and there's a J or a G connected. Notice, to increase their odds even higher, they don't say that the person who passed had a J or G name. They just say a J or G name is connected to the deceased. They tell me to talk about the J or G connection. As in, they're related to someone with a J or G name, which remember, is just about everybody. Now, these are the same exact types of tricks used by mentalists. When you take a look at a lot of the mediums out there, I know exactly what those mediums are doing, and I think many of them are scum. I think they're taking advantage of people in a very vulnerable moment. And there is nothing supernatural about rigging the odds in your favor, making a hit a statistical inevitability. It's easy to roll sixes every time when you play with loaded dice, and it's easy to fool vulnerable and grieving audience members when they're too desperate to realize you've stacked the deck. But once they get these hits, they narrow in on one person. How do they continue to get hit after hit? Well, assuming that they're not doing a hot reading, which I covered in my last video, then they're probably using other cold reading tricks, including Barnum statements, which I'll cover in my next video. Make sure that you're subscribed and click that bell button to get notified so that you don't miss it. If you believe in my cause and you wanna help support my work promoting science, curiosity, and free thought, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash holykoolaid. Even just a dollar helps me to continue making these videos. If you're one of my supporters on Patreon, thank you. You guys are amazing. I can't make these videos without your support and your help, and it means so much to me. If you're new to this channel, hit the subscribe button. I really hope you like the rest of my content. Feel free to like and share. You guys rock so much, and together, we're making a difference.